Hey guys, welcome back. This is the story about what if Naruto was a hollow. Before we start, please subscribe to the channel and like the video as well, it really means a lot. So let's start the what if. Lost No Chase was completely abandoned. Ten years ago, the fortress would have been thriving with abundant hollow and Arankar activity, but there had been a change in power from around that time. Aizen Susuk had been killed and replaced as leader, and with that the purpose of Lost No Chase had disappeared. The Arankar that had been left over had relocated into eastern Huecamundo, and the palace was left empty in their wake. A lone man walked through the ruins of Huecomund, looking for something. He was dressed in a white trench coat and hat, and was carrying what seemed to be some kind of standard for an organization. It was his group that had been responsible for reducing the palace of Los Noches to ruins, and they still couldn't find any information until today. Tai Cho. We found out where they are, he called out. Ever since the rebellion, the Arankar had disappeared from this part of Huecomundo, long before the Vandenreich had set up their base within Huecomundo. Without Arankars that they could subjugate and bend to their will, their plans had been delayed by several years. They hadn't been able to declare war on Soul Society. The member of the Jagdarmi turned around, the standard he was flying pivoting with him. He was looking at a man who was sitting in an ornate chair in the middle of the landscape, his legs crossed and his hand resting on his cheek. He looked calmly pleased with the news. Kurjopi didn't say anything to his subordinate, they weren't stupid, they could finish the report on their own. Kurj's subordinate looked at the surrounding area one last time. We believe they relocated ten years ago after the fall of Aizen into eastern Huecomundo, several thousand miles away from Los Noches. They are apparently planning something, but I'm not sure what. Regardless, we can track their whereabouts from here on, he reported. Kurt smiled a little wider and got to his feet. I see. What will we do now, sir? asked the Jagdarmi member. Kurt walked up to him. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make the trip to their new headquarters and establish contact with these Arankar. We are the recruiting officers of the Vandenreich, and we will see if we can subjugate them, bend them to our will if you please, Kurj said, turning his back on his subordinate. Johabaksama would need to be informed about these recent events. But sir, this Vulpus seed that is leading this group is said to be very uncontrollable and powerful. Are you sure we can subjugate these Arankar with a leader like that? he asked. Don't you worry, we are the Jagdarmi of the Vandenreich. There is no Arankar we can't subjugate. West of Los Noches, in the opposite direction of the Reino Animal and Naruto's new locale, there lied a strange fortress that had been erected into the Huecomundo Desert, after the Vandenreich had gained access to Huecomundo. In terms of architecture, it seemed to be very similar to Los Noches, though it wasn't on the scale of such a palace. It was a much simpler abode, but within it lied an army that was truly to be feared, with a leader that wasn't the most pleasant man to be following. Like Los Noches, there was a throne room that held this particular leader of the palace. He was a large man, with long black hair and mutton chops that could give even the most rugged man a run for his money. He was. Juhabak. His right-hand man Hashwald stood at the foot of his throne. His lord was particularly aloof towards his Quincy warriors, even if he was absolutely ruthless to an Arankar. The invasion of Huecomundo hadn't really gone as planned thus far, they hadn't located many Arankar though, so there were only a few dozen within their army. Juhabaksama, it appears that we have located the base of Vulpus C, as Soul Society calls him, Hashwald said, as his leader calmly reacted to the news. I see. Arankars have been precious valuables around here, but now we have stumbled upon a vast gold mine of them. What of courage? he asked. I, he's on his way back now. He apparently wants to take a few of the stern ritter with him to confront the Arankar. After that, he's going to travel to their base and establish contact with them. Their leader will be the most troublesome to deal with. Hashwald said. Yes, he will be. However, conquering Huecomundo is not the only project we have on our mind now. We need to deal with the Soul Society as well, and I believe I know a way that we may soften up these Arankar should they be hard to subjugate, Juhabak said. 
You mean? Yes, the Kanoha Association may be able to play a firm role in this, and we may consolidate this by using the only Shinigami we have within the Stern Ritter. Follow me. He said, rising from his throne. Hashwald bowed to his lord, following him out of the throne room and into the hallway. They walked for just a few seconds, coming to a plain door at the end of the hall with the letter L plastered on it. Hashwald looked at it bizarrely for a second. Stern Ritter L, the love. The only member of the entire Vandenrake that is a Shinigami, but not just any Shinigami. The current captain of the Kido Corps in Seoul Society, and a double agent for us. He whispered, as Juhabak knocked on the door gently. Come in. Came a suave female voice. It was at that moment that Hashwald realized that he had never even been in Stern Ritter L's room or even seen her, she usually kept to herself when she was in the Vandenrake fortress. Juhabak smirked, before he opened the door lightly. The room was pitch black, but Hashwald could tell what was inside the room from a few outlines, and it was fairly disturbing. The moldy old wallpaper was peeling, but that wasn't the striking thing about the walls. Rather, all throughout it, the words, do you love me, were scratched into the wood with what appeared to be a crude blade. The room itself was a mess, with bloody sheets and tattered furniture all over the floor, and a particularly large vanity in the back end of the room. There were two stands opposite each other just inside the room, holding clothes. One seemed to hold the Stern Ritter's Vandenrake uniform, and the other seemed to hold her Keto Core robes. There was a bed over to the far right, with a human figure shadowed in it. Hashwald couldn't really see her, but he assumed that she was the Stern Ritter they were looking for. It was strange looking at her, she seemed to be going back and forth through this bizarre motion with her arm, making this breathy moaning noise, while she was at it. She also seemed to be completely naked. Hashwald grimaced as he realized what was going on, and hastily averted his eyes even though he couldn't actually see her inside the room. Juhabak was unfazed by the whole spectacle, though he did not walk inside. Oh, Juhabak. What brings you to my room, she asked, a tinge of lust inside her tone. Juhabak smiled. You probably could figure it out by now. We found the location of Vulpa C and his army, we're going to establish contact. But, you, as the captain of the Kido Corps have a suitable tie with the Kanoha Association, who have been known to desire an invasion of Huecomundo and a declaration of war against that hollow. You have the means to ensure their transportation to Huecomundo, make sure they get here. He trailed off, as the nude woman finished her business and stood on her feet. She didn't step into the light though. Sakura. Ten years ago, Naruto and his Espada vacated Los Noches for a much simpler area in eastern Huecomundo. Unbeknownst to him, Los Noches had been destroyed as a building a few months prior, but no Shinigami attack force ever invaded Huecomundo. Naruto had stopped by his old kingdom once, to pick up El Libro de Ciclos, which he had left there in his long absence. But, despite leading once again, there was no lavish palace or system of government in place now. The new locale for Naruto's fighting force was a few hundred miles west of the Huecomundo coast, where the desert began to turn into grasslands. Instead of a palace or fortress, there were about 50 large tents, 10 shacks, and a massive long hall in the center which housed all of the Erenkar force. The hollow force resided in about a hundred mile radius around the long hall, and most of them were congregated in a massive canyon that the settlement overlooked, or underground. Each of the shacks belonged to a particular espada, but inside the long hall was a massive table based off of the one found within Las Noches, with a giant chair behind it that could serve as a throne. The desert around the area served as the training grounds for all personnel. Outside the settlement's ground, Kurjopi and two Jagdarmi overlooked the area. They couldn't see any Erenkar out on the surface, but they knew the second they found this place that it was where they were. The Ryatsu here was fierce, but they were ready. They spotted the massive long hall in the center, that was where they needed to go, and Vulpus C already knew they were coming. This was supposed to be a diplomatic meeting between two rival groups, but that would most likely go downhill very fast. As the Jagdarmi walked throughout the village, a few Erenkar walked around the makeshift village. Some of them chuckled at the Quincy's, and other glared. 
But, what was truly odd about them was that not a single one attacked Kirch. Instead, they give him his space, which seemed to be an indicator that Vulpus C knew he was here. And he was giving him the warmest welcome he knew of. Kirch opened the door to the long hall. There was nobody there except for the single figure sitting on the chair on the far end of the room. Kirch was surprised. This wasn't like the reports of Vulpus C. What sat in front of him appeared to be little more than a blonde kid who looked about 16 or 17, even if he was an errand car. Naruto's appearance remained relatively unchanged throughout the 10 years. His age hadn't changed at all, and he kept the errand car uniform that had been popularized by Aizen Susuk. Even his mask fragments remained the same, and the average person wouldn't be able to tell that this errand car had mastered the Resurrection, Segunda Etapa not too long ago. Because of this, Naruto exuded an aura of power that he hadn't before, even at the height of his service underneath Aizen Susuk. Kirch had gotten a glimpse of another espada while filing into the village, he could tell by his riatsu. It was a long skinny looking Eren car with a strange side-like sunpakuto. His appearance too had not changed at all from years before, but this espada oozed power, and on the inside, there were differences. If these espada released their zanpaktos, there would be differences of power from 10 years ago. These 10 Eren car were dangerous, dangerous killing machines, and were worlds beyond that of their old selves. Kurge didn't know what they were capable of, or even what their names were, but in hindsight this might have been a bad idea. He wasn't feeling too confident after feeling their riatsu, and he didn't know if the Vandenrake would be able to subjugate them, or even match them in combat. So, you're part of that group that's been sneaking around Huecomundo these past few years? Going by the looks of you and the feel of your riatsu, you're all Quincy's. He stated. Already, Naruto was entertaining about killing them, and it was unlikely that this people would leave alive. Yes, sir, Vulpus, see, sir. My name is Kurjopi, and I am the first Jagdarmi of the Vandenrake. It is my great hope that our two organizations can get along well in the future. Kurj started, fake politeness tinging his voice. Someone's going to be sent to kill me, these Quincy's just want to conquer Huecomundo. Naruto thought. And, what does your group want from us? Well, it is our hope that we form an alliance with you. For a limited time only, my leader allowing Eren Kar to become our comrades, so please don't miss this precious chance. Kurge was smiling deviously in his mind, this wasn't likely to work out in their favor, so they would have to use alternative methods to get them to their side. The Eren Kar leader didn't seem to be the wiser about this. Naruto grinned deviously at Kurge and the other two Vandenrake members, before he stood up from his chair. He pointed at them seriously, before he panned his eyes to behind him for a second, before Kurge could notice. No, I will not ally myself with you fucking humans, and I definitely won't be subservient to whoever the hell your leader is. If you want to talk business, tell your leader to come himself, and also tell him to not bring any ass-kissing lackeys next time. Maybe he should just kill them now. Kurge never lost that calm smile on his face, but he raised his hand in what was supposed to be a placating gesture. Naruto grinned, he did bring people like them after all. He locked eyes with Kurge, never breaking eye contact as two figures burst through the wooden walls of the long hall and rushed towards him. Kurge grinned, before laughing. He had brought two stern Ritter along with him for purely this reason, to get the jump on Naruto should he refuse their offer. Stern Ritter you, Nanana Nejikup and Stern Ritter O, Driscoll Bursi were the ones that he had brought along with him. They had been lying in wait outside the long hall, listening in on the conversation, prepared to intervene if need be. They were in midair, directly behind Naruto. The Eren car was still turned towards Kurge, and seemingly hadn't noticed their presence yet. Of course, in reality he noticed their presence a few minutes ago. They came at him with a speed that was relatively easy to manage. Naruto was prepared for them. He used Sonido, and dashed away from the spot where they were aiming to attack, flashing into a spot a few feet away from where they struck the ground. He released his Riatsu, and drew his Zanpakuto, flicking it horizontally in a light swing. It caught Nanana in a quick flash, bisecting him down the middle while he was in the process of recoiling from his own attack. 
Yu Driscoll started in anger, surprised at how quick Naruto was. Naruto grinned psychotically, appearing behind Driscoll before he could even react. Naruto sheathed his Zanpakuto, and then thrust his hand into Driscoll's abdomen, quick as a flash. Driscoll couldn't even get out his Quincy weapon to retaliate. You know, I haven't killed a Quincy in a long time. He started, putting a hand to his chin in mock thought. He twisted his hand in Driscoll's abdomen, allowing the larger man to gasp in pain. Your arrival here makes me want to just go to the human world and slaughter anyone who has even the slightest amount of unique abilities. The fact that you people are alive means that soul society missed some 200 years ago, unfortunately, Naruto said. He pulled his hand out of the Quincy, and when he doubled over in pain Naruto kicked him up at a frightening rate, jamming him in the roof of the long hall. He flicked his Zanpakuto one last time, and the two Vandenrake that were supporting Kurge were sliced in half by the simple wind of his blow. Kurge was standing there, rooted in place. He didn't dare get out his own weapon. Leave. If you want to talk negotiations, bring your actual boss here next time. Though, I won't guarantee that I won't use my army and just obliterate your forces right now. You Quincy's don't belong in Huecamundo anyway. Kurge turned to leave, but he heard a raucous laughter come from behind him as soon as he turned his back on Naruto. Oh, wait. I've changed my mind. Naruto said happily, bringing out his Sanpakuto yet again. Despite promising to let Kurge go, Naruto bisected the Jagdarmi leader before he could even react, with a giddy little chuckle. Woo, that felt good. Not being a subordinate to Aizen has really done wonders for my emotional state, he said, lazily flopping down on his throne. He would have to call a meeting with the Espada to discuss this new matter, but in approximately a week there were more important matters to attend to. All of their reserve army had been rounded up and underneath one leadership, and Stark had mastered his Segunda Etapa about a month before, the last one to do so. They were ready. Kurosaki Ichigo was beginning to forget things. Nothing important, of course. He knew that he was once a substitute Shinigami for Soul Society, he knew he had friends that were killed 10 years ago in Las Noches. He remembered his family and friends that he left behind in the human world, he thought about them every day of his life. However, he was having a hard time remembering faces. His home of Karakura town got fuzzier and fuzzier in his memory as the days went by, and there were only a few very important faces he could recall from off the top of his head. This honestly worried him, if he spent so much time in Hoikomundo, would his old memories leave him completely? He had discussed this with Orihime many times, but she couldn't give him a straight answer either. Whatever the case, they had given up on ever returning to the human world after Ichigo had tried and failed to open up a garganta. The vagrant life within Hoikomundo had turned the two humans wild, though. Ichigo was still in his Shinigami form, so he had aged less than Orihime had by quite a bit. Granted, he was still a human, and therefore even he didn't have the full slowed aging of a true Shinigami, and altogether he looked like he was around 18. He looked a little bulkier than when he was a teenager, and his orange hair had gotten even wilder. On his face there was a little bit of stubble, and his robes had become tattered from years of wearing them. Orihime, on the other hand had been affected by standard human aging. Gone was the young high school girl of around 16, and in her place was a mature, voluptuous 26-year-old woman. Yet, Huecamundo had affected even her. Her straight, glossy hair had become wild and almost tattered, and the same robe she had worn all this time was becoming as tattered as Ichigo's. All in all, she looked like an Amazonian woman, minus the height. They had wandered into the east after they had escaped from Las Noches. For the first few months, they were forced to eat small hollows that came out of the desert landscape, but once the desert turned into grassland, they were able to find edible plants all throughout the area. They continued wandering after that, never really in a hurry to be anywhere. Overall, they were at least able to find some appreciation for the natural beauty of Huecamundo, but they longed for their home anyway. Despite seeing many different locales within Huecamundo, even they were surprised when they reached the coastline. And the shocks would continue when the spotted an enormous palace inland by only a few miles. The palace had set off both Ichigo and Orihime's nerves, it reminded them too much of Las Noches. 
Despite that, there was something about it that was off, but Ichigo couldn't quite place what it was. The main gates to the palace were wide open, and looked like they hadn't been moved in years. In fact, the entire palace was like that, now that Ichigo looked at it a bit closer. The paint was beginning to fade, and the walls themselves were becoming eroded. Ichigo tentatively stepped inside the main gates of the palace, Orihime close behind him. It wasn't long before they came across the foyer of the palace, where the Huecamundo sky overlooked all of the area. There wasn't a hollow or errand car in sight, this place had been abandoned for years it seemed like. There were a few buildings that rose up out of the landscape, but overall the inside of the palace just seemed to be a flat plain. There were two particular buildings that caught their eye, however, as these were the biggest and most obvious landmarks in the area. One was a plain grey building of Bauhaus architecture, though with its broken windows it obviously wasn't serving any purpose. The other landmark was even larger than the building, and it resembled a stadium of sorts. Out of all the landmarks here, this one seemed by far the most intact of the bunch, though it also had a sort of lonely feel to it. Ichigo turned to Orihime, and Orihime turned to Ichigo. They were wandering spirits after all, they would go wherever their hearts told them to. Something about that stadium told them that there might be useful resources available to them there. It took them about half an hour to get there, and the wrought iron gates that served as the entrance were rusted clean off, allowing the two humans to easily breach the security of the arena. Ichigo stepped out onto the field, taking a look into the spectators' stands. Several of the seats were being overgrown with vines. As he stepped onto the floor, his foot made a strange noise as it walked. Curious, he bent over, looking at the dirt that covered the arena floor. After a little bit of digging, he struck metal. Hey, Inoue. Come look at this, he called out, as the woman walked out onto the stage. She walked up to her companion, looking down at the metal contraption. There was a line going between the metal, separating it into two halves, and it looked like it could be opened. Well, what do you think? Ichigo asked. Orihime didn't say anything, and Ichigo took her lack of an answer that this was something worth investigating. He took another look at the stands, noticing what seemed to be an announcer's box high in the balcony. Kurosaki-kun? Orihime asked as Ichigo began to ascend the steps to the box. He approached the door and jiggled the knob a little bit. The locks had also apparently rusted over time, and he was able to gain access with no real trouble. The inside of the room was dark, obviously, but there was a peculiar mechanism on the opposite side of the side, and besides the announcer's table it seemed to be the only important feature within the room. Ichigo touched the lever of the machine, it was broken. Still, it looked like it could still be moved with a little bit of elbow grease, so the substitute Shinigami pulled on it tightly, feeling the tumblers underneath slowly but surely begin to move. With a little shove, he pulled the lever down completely. There was a low rumbling that resounded throughout the area, which made Ichigo shake in place a little bit. Orihime stumbled, rapidly getting out of the way and into the stands as the floor began to move. The metal doors that were on the stadium floor were opening, displacing the dirt as they retreated into the arena. Ichigo and Orihime watched with bated breath, they didn't know what this was, but both of them had a bad feeling about what they would find. It took a few minutes for it to open completely, and the mechanism got jammed a few times. When the floor had receded entirely, Orihime looked over the edge. She adjusted her eyes for a moment before they widened. Ichigo was up in the box when he heard Orihime scream. He turned around faster than he realized, throwing himself out of the announcer's box and rushing to Orihime's aid. Thankfully for him, Orihime wasn't harmed in the slightest, and there wasn't a hollow attack in the slightest. Despite that, something seemed to have stunned her, as she was pointing a shaky finger down in the hole, her eyes fixated on something that was apparently down there. Three seconds later, and Ichigo was right beside her. In no way, what's row, he was cut off as he looked down into the pit, and he grimaced in disgust and alarm. Down there were a multitude of corpses, but Ichigo could tell they were not of hollow origin. They had no masks or holes that would identify them as such, and Ichigo didn't know how to describe them. The blood had dried along the walls, so he knew that they had been dead for quite some time now, 
But there were other questions that popped into his head. What were they doing here and how did they die among them? There was one faint Ryatsu he could detect down in the pit, and he tentatively looked over the edge. Huddled in the corner seemed to be a girl of around 16 years of age. Her face was buried in her hands, but going from her dirty garb, Ichigo could tell that she had been here for a while. Ichigo winced at the gaunt face that looked up towards the light as her cavern opened. How long had she truly been down here? And why was she the only humanoid figure in a room where everyone else had been turned into something not of this world? Her stare was pure insanity though, the way that she looked at the two of them sent shivers down his spine. And slowly, she was beginning to get to her feet. She attempted to talk, but no words came out. She hadn't used her voice box for the better part of a century, she didn't even know if she could speak her own language anymore. She attempted to talk, the words coming out as garbled screech, before she finally got a grasp on the words she was looking for. Who, are you? What is this? Ichigo managed to get out, looking down upon the grisly display of events. Despite that, the fate of those things weren't what was bothering him, as they looked like they had been dead for years. No, it was the young girl who looked around his age, who was still alive down there. How long had she been here? Hey, he said impulsively, jumping down into the pit. Orihime tried to stop him, but he had already gone down there, picking up the near unconscious, gibbering girl in his hands, using his Shinigami powers to hop back up onto the ledge. He laid the blonde girl down the ground, she was dirty and ragged. Her eyes were wide open and staring into space, reflecting the lunacy that was held within them. Her mouth was open, but most of the time no sound came out, and when it did, it was pure gibberish. When she managed to enunciate full sentences, they were very garbled and difficult to understand. Are you okay? Ichigo asked frantically. Ichigo winced a little as she grasped his wrist very forcefully, tilting her head slowly to look at him. Her eyes suddenly became even more bloodshot, and an abject hiss sounded as she opened her mouth. Kill. Me. Now, she hissed, before she screamed the last part out. Out of impulse, Ichigo tore himself free of the girl's grasp, stepping away and staring at her incredulously. The way she had said that disturbed both Ichigo and Orihime. It wasn't a kind of pleading tone, one where they were absolutely desperate to die. No, instead it was an angry, demanding kind of tone, one that promised great pain should her request be denied. Kill me now, she shouted again, not getting up. Ichigo took an uneasy step forward, once again going up to the fallen girl. He stared at her tentatively, watching as she occasionally twitched. What happened here? Why are you here? Who are you? He opted to ask, instead of complete the girl's request. Surprisingly, the girl didn't fly into a rage at that. Pit. Kanoha. Hollow killed them, mercy. She babbled onwards, her words making no sense to the pair of other humans who had stumbled across her. What's she saying, Kurosaki-kun? Orihime asked, trying to decipher the jumbled words. I think she's trying to tell us something about this pit, and what happened down there. Ichigo commented, watching the girl go through yet another spasm. Ichigo dropped his sword into the ground as her spasms got more violent, pulling her head onto his lap to support her. He did this, did this to all of us. Had to kill them. She mumbled. Her sentences seemed to be getting less jumbled. Did this to who? Orihime asked soothingly, trying not to set the girl on edge. Name. Naruto. Turned comrades, into things. Had to, kill them, couldn't let them suffer, anymore. She said. Her eyes were fairly blank, and all she did now was stare into space, and from the way her voice sounded, she was talking to neither Ichigo or Orihime. Ichigo latched onto one word in that sentence. Naruto. Who's that? The name sounded familiar, and Ichigo felt that this, Naruto, person was someone he should know. King, of place. Attacked. Kanoha. She replied, before she stopped staring out into space. Suddenly, like she wasn't even motionless anymore, 
her arm shot out, grabbing Ichigo's sword and holding it to her own neck. Must die, been unable to, had to find a way to save them, but it was hopeless. She babbled. A few tears fell down from her eyelids, but whether it was joy over a long sought after release, or sorrow over past events, no one could tell. This action seemed to catch both Ichigo and Orihime off guard, with the former wondering how he had been so careless to allow a sharp weapon within this clearly suicidal girl's grasp. Wait, don't be so hasty. You don't have to do this. Ichigo shouted at her, while making sure to not make any sudden movements that would startle the girl enough for her to thrust forward. The pain's too much, she said, in her first full sentence of the entire conversation. She seemed to be becoming more and more aware of her surroundings as time went on. Before Ichigo or Orihime could manage to get out another word, the girl plunged Ichigo's sword into her jugular vein, effectively ending her life as red liquid poured from the vital spot at an impossible to halt rate. Ichigo wrenched the sword from her grasp just a split second too late, just as the girl penetrated her own flesh deep enough and fell to the ground, coughing heavily, but with a last-minute smile on her face. The two travelers were shocked by how quickly that occurred. Within minutes of freeing the girl from the deep chamber, she babbles some words that they really couldn't make sense of, and then takes her own life. It was so surreal that neither of them knew what to make of it. Things like this just didn't happen, not even in Huecamundo. At least, not without a cause. There was something about this that stuck on Ichigo's mind, however. The girl that had just committed suicide seemed to point to the fact that there was a certain culprit who organized whatever had happened. The girl also seemed to mention that she had killed a bunch of her own villagers, which meant that there were more people who were subjected to a seemingly similar fate. This seemed to be a hollow kingdom, similar to ones that Ichigo and Orihime had encountered during their travels, but it was on a much larger scale, not to mention it seemed abandoned. This Naruto person seemed to be important in the scale of things though. Perhaps he was their leader. Whatever the case, he seemed to be the one who was responsible for this spectacle, but there was too much information they hadn't gleaned, and therefore they didn't know the full circumstances of the incident that the girl was talking about. Regardless, they knew that some horrible crime had taken place here. Juhabaksama. A lone, injured member of the Jagmurdi stumbled through the Vandenrake Palace in Huecamundo, having just got back from her recruiting mission on the other side of the world. After witnessing the events that took place there, he had to rush back as soon as possible. This was bad. This was very, very bad. He barged into the throne room, screw the consequences. Johabak was sitting on his throne, a light smile on his face as he regarded the disturbed Jagdarmi member. On his right was his faithful servant, Hashwald. On his left was a pink-haired woman that the Jagdarmi didn't recognize. He knew, however, from the crazed look in her eyes, that he never wanted to cross her. Johabaksama, we've got trouble, he shouted at his leader. If it were any other situation, he would have bowed in his presence. Hmm, what? You are part of the Jagdarmi, right? Where is Kurge? Johabak asked. Dead. The Jagdarmi member stuttered out. He's dead. They're all dead. Kerch Taicho and the two stern Ritter sent with us are all dead, he shouted desperately at his supreme leader. Johabak had the decency to look slightly taken aback. What? On that mission of yours? Who killed them? Vulpus, see, your highness. Although, I've heard that his real name is Naruto. The leader of the Arankar, whatever the case. He's the one who killed them, and so quickly too. It was a massacre. They never stood a chance. He paused for a moment. He said that if we wanted to talk negotiations, you needed to go, Juhabak-sama. Instead of being wiped off his face, Juhabaka's smile actually got wider. He relaxed in his seat and turned to look at Sakura. Her eyes had widened significantly after she heard the Jagdarmi speak Naruto's name, and even he couldn't tell what she was thinking. The woman looked quite a bit different than when he had last seen her. Her face had been covered in shadow then, but now one could see that she looked like a woman of around 25, 
with shoulder-length pink hair pulled into a short ponytail, which was looped through the back of her Vandenrate cap. Instead of being totally naked like earlier, she was fully clothed in a custom-made Vandenrake uniform, similar in appearance to Bambietis. Her Zanpakuto was held at her hip, a fairly short katana with a pink hilt and seashell-shaped guard. It's alright. I know you didn't mean to fail, now did you? Juhabak asked, a little too politely. The jag dummy blinked for a moment, before a hole the size of a basketball was punched straight through his stomach. Nobody flinched. I guess those three weren't enough to convince them. We still need Aaron Car power though, and they're the only ones who can supply it. I'll have to send someone who is capable enough to show off our power to them. Juhabak mused. He turned to the left. Sakura, would you be willing to pick up Kurge's mission and recruit some more Aaron Car? With your power, it shouldn't be difficult to defeat them, even if their leader seems to be somewhat powerful. Sakura smiled deviously, but didn't say a word. That was enough confirmation that Juhabak needed. The Vandenrake Palace lie in ruin, similar to Las Noches. The wooden infrastructure had been completely demolished, but this time dead bodies were sprinkled all over the blood, and the smell of blood lingered in the air. On top of the pile of wood, Haruno Sakura stood triumphant, still dressed in her Vandenrake uniform, though her feet was resting on the dead body of Juhabak for she had killed all of them. Every last one. Sakura had no use for the Vandenrake anymore, no, now that she learned of Naruto's whereabouts, she had bigger fish to try. Her hatred of Hollows, notwithstanding, she would find him. Yet, her other objective, bring the members of Kanoha to Huecamundo, was still in play. If only for her own personal desire and gain, she would get them to Huecamundo. Especially with her upcoming ceremony within Soul Society, it would be perfect. But first, she needed to find Naruto. Naruto suited himself up for the attack on Soul Society, and was about to call all his espada to him so they could begin the invasion. Sale had already completed all preparations. They left, today. They destroyed Soul Society, today. Naruto could hardly wait. He fastened his Zanpakuto to his waist and adjusted his Arankar uniform, descending from his throne and crossing the long hall. He opened the flap to his tent, stepping out into the Huecomundo air. As he breached outside, a pale Arankar around his size approached him. Like many of the other Espada, Olquiora's outward appearance in his unreleased had changed much. Other than his mask covering more of his head, there wasn't anything. Despite that, Olquiora had proven himself immensely when he revealed that he was the only one before the use of the Hugyoku to have obtained Segunda Etapa. With that goal already reached, he had spent the next 10 years simply improving his already existing abilities, and as such he had attained the position of Segunda Espada, behind only Naruto himself. Naruto, we're having a little issue. A random woman showed up in the camp today asking for you, she's already killed three of our Arankar. Should I send her your way? Olquiora asked. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Could it be more Quincy's? Uh, yeah, go ahead and do that. I'll see what the fuss is about and deal with her myself if I have to. He said, still a little confused. What was the big deal about this woman? As long as she didn't kill any Espada, there was nothing to worry about. Naruto's attitude did a quick on 80 as the woman in question entered his field of vision and noticed him. Her features were a little different, and she looked older, but he knew that shock of pink hair from anywhere. Haruno Sakura Naruto's passive face took on an extreme look of hatred as his brow furrowed. His pupils began tiny pinpricks in a sea of red, and he bit his bottom lip in a massive sneer, his fangs poking through his mouth. He snarled so loudly it might as well have been a scream, and released the full brunt of his riatsu. All around the camp, Aaron Carr and Hollows alike held their breath as they felt the full force of their leader's riatsu, smothering them like an ocean of water. Okuyora, who was the most resistant to it, turned his back stoically, but even he had a bead of sweat rolling down his cheek. He had only felt this force of riatsu from Naruto once before, and that could only mean one thing. Something big was about to happen, and they weren't even in Soul Society yet. 
Rage still on his face, Naruto drew his son Pakuto immediately, rushing Sakura and slammed his sword down on her with all the force he could muster. The clang of metal was heard all around the camp as Sakura actually managed to block Naruto's attack. Sakura was standing there, a lustful smirk on her face as she blocked Naruto's first attack. She slowly licked her lips and pushed off Naruto with her own Zanpakuto. Naruto lightly jumped back, putting distance between the two. Sakura. He sneered. He clutched his Zanpakuto tight in his hands when he saw the smirk on her face. I've been looking all over for you, Naruto, and I've finally found you, she said, her tongue peeking out of her lips yet again. She didn't to sense Naruto's extreme hatred towards her. Or better yet, she sensed it, and was drinking it up. I can feel your anger. Neither Naruto nor Sakura realized that she just uttered one of the most famous movie quotes ever, but the words did their purpose and had a profound effect on Naruto. Bitch, he roared. He sheathed his Zanpakuto for a moment. He then put both of his hands out, spreading each and every one of his fingers out a fair distance. He concentrated his Riatsu to his hands, where each of his fingers lit up with a little blip of orange. Diaz Ciros, he shouted, as the blips of light formed into individual Ciros. The ten beams rocketed off of his hands, each one almost as strong as a normal Ciro. The ten beams of orange traveled in a straight line for a second, before they merged together to form one giant attack that barreled toward Sakura. Sakura held one hand out, catching the giant Ciro with her palm. Her grin faltered as she realized she didn't have the strength to fully stop it, and just as she was about to be overwhelmed, she dodged to the side instantly. The blast obliterated everything in its path, including a few tents with Erenkar inside them. Sakura whistled at the damage, smiling as she grabbed her Vandenrate cap and threw it to the side. Naruto fired another round of the same attacks, and Sakura's eyes narrowed a little bit in mirth. It seems you've become much stronger over the years, you're even leading this massive. Truly, the destructive power of this attack in incredible. But. She trailed off, talking to herself. She held her Zanpakuto out. Heido number 91. Senju Kudan Taiho, she said. Pink dots, similar in appearance to Naruto's Siro, formed in the air around Sakura like a halo. When she fired them off, it converged on the rapidly approaching Siro, effectively cancelling out the attack in a gigantic explosion. The impact of the two Kido and the Siro caused an enormous cloud of dust to rise in the area, giving both Naruto and Sakura cover. Naruto looked around for her, but when out of the corner of his eye he saw a quick flash of movement, he raised his Zanpakuto and swung out. Sakura was in mid-air, her Zanpakuto slashing downwards at Naruto's scalp. Naruto met her attack with an upward slice, grinding his Zanpakuto against hers. Sakura swung her hips to the rhythm of the attack, getting herself pumped up for the fight. Naruto himself seemed to get over his initial anger towards Sakura, and was now in euphoric fight mode, where he could finally kill this bitch. This is too good. I never thought that one of my targets would actually come to me. Naruto guffawed. Sakura wasn't phased. Ah, it seems like you're still obsessed with getting a date with me. Let me ask you, do you love me? Sakura whispered that last part, as a look of lust entered her eyes. She stood there in an almost seductive position, crooning at Naruto. Ha! Huh? Naruto asked. Her behavior was perplexing, even to him. I'm asking if you love me. I can feel such strong feelings coming from you, it has to be love, she shouted chaotically at Naruto, who laughed raucously at her. Love you? Fuck no, bitch. That seemed to spurn on the first negative reaction that Sakura gave Naruto. A vein popped on her forehead, but her entire face reddened in anger and her eyes bulged out in rage. What? She screamed in indignation, like it was the most surprising thing in the world. She released her full Riatsu in her rage, and swung her Zanpakuto to the sky. Tempt! She shouted, as water surrounded the tip of her blade. Naruto was on guard. Hmm, he muttered. Hankara, she finished her Zanpakuto release. The wave of water wrapped around her katana, 
glowing with Sakura's pink riatsu. She thrust it down into the ground, sending a shockwave into the dirt and sand. Naruto focused on the ripple of force that was moving through the ground, before his eyes snapped open and he jumped off of the ground, landing in midair right above a hut. Eren Kara that were in the surrounding area moved out of the way of the fight, hoping they didn't get caught in the crossfire. Whatever the invader was doing couldn't be good either. The ripple of force settled, and it was quiet for a few seconds. But after that, a jet of water erupted from the ground like a geyser, spreading a few inches of water depth throughout the surrounding area. Naruto heard a rumbling from underneath the hut he was floating near, before he dodged another geyser that erupted from the ground. While he was moving through the air, focusing on the water, Sakura attacked him in mid-air, trying to lop off his head in her rage. Naruto just got his sword up in time, but the force of her blow was staggering. Yet, there was something off about the whole thing. The water on the ground didn't look normal or anything. Normal water was completely clear, or it was in the human world at least, but this water looked shinier. It seemed to have a lustrous quality to it, and it was setting off alarm bells in Naruto's head. Sakura's Sanpakuto also changed. Instead of a normal, metal katana like an unreleased Sanpakuto, it was now completely made out of calcium. To be more specific, it seemed to be completely made out of seashell. The hilt was made of seashell, the guard was made of seashell, and the blade was made of seashell. It seemed sharp too, but what really caught Naruto's eye was the tip of blade, which was actually wide instead of narrow, with a large opening that ran into the blade. It was like there was a conch shell merged straight into the sword. Naruto swung his sword three more times in quick succession, and Sakura blocked them all. His last strike actually got caught in the ridges of her sword, and it broke his rhythm when he yanked it out quickly. Using his momentary confusion, Sakura flipped over Naruto's head, attempted to carve in his unprotected back. Naruto swung around to match her speed, driving his own blade into the hole of the conch. He attempted to wrestle Sakura's released sword from her grasp, but Sakura's insane strength remained tried and true even during the afterlife. Naruto was beginning to overwhelm her, and Sakura was growling at him. However, before Naruto could wrench the blade fully from her grasp, a jet of highly pressurized water shot from the conch on Sakura's blade, barreling right into Naruto's talk. The force of the blow pushed Naruto back as the water seared his stomach. He grunted in pain as he impacted a hut directly behind, destroying it completely. He rose from the rubble, wiping blood away from his mouth. There was something off about this battle. Sakura had proven herself for a very worthy opponent, he couldn't even fathom how she had gotten this strong. And yet, her shirkai was surprisingly dull. She used it well obviously, but he thought that someone of her caliber should have a more impressive shirkai. That, and the strange quality of the water, put him on edge. There was something missing here. If she was hiding her current abilities, it would only make things more difficult in the long run. Unfortunately for him, she also gave off no clues as to what her other abilities could be, except for the shine upon the water. But he had no idea what it did. He projected a look of hatred at Sakura, and it was clear that she could feel his emotions. Strangely, his hatred for her seemed to put her at ease, and she giggled sadistically a little bit, her rage all but forgotten. Oh, I see what's going on. You're playing hard to get, aren't you? She asked, to the confusion of Naruto. Was this bitch confusing hatred for love or something? She was as crazy as him. Sakura wove her sword around, dispelling her shirkai and sheathing her blade. What are you doing? You know this battle's not over yet. I'm gonna kill you right here, bitch. Naruto shouted. Sakura smirked at Naruto, she knew how to get the advantage over him. No, you're not. And do you know why? It's because I am a necessary asset if you want to truly destroy Soul Society, she blurted out, making Naruto halt in place. How do you know about that? Oh, please, Naruto, she snorted. I was a double agent for Aizen within Soul Society before you took him out. I knew you were the Primera Espada, and I knew all about your desire to destroy Soul Society. The only thing I didn't know was that you had the stones to actually challenge and defeat Aizen, 
and your location over the past few years. And now, I'm going to join the winning team. Naruto attacked once again, slamming his blade into the ground as Sakura dodged to the side. I don't believe you, bitch. What makes you think you have anything you could offer me? Sakura held up a finger. It's simple, really. I offer you what might be the most important piece of your entire plan. You see, I am the captain of the Kido Corps within Soul Society, but I'm getting a promoted tomorrow, due to my creation of a new type of Kido. From that point on, I will become a new member of the Zero Division, or otherwise known as the Royal Guard. I assume you know the only way one is able to access the Ryokyu, she asked rhetorically. Naruto was silent. I'm sure you have your own little plan worked out at this point, but at this point the only way to access the Ryokyu is through a member of the Royal Guard. I assume that you had planned to lure them out of their hiding place when you completely destroyed Soul Society. That might be effective, but it's a risky move if you're trying to access the Ryokyu. I am the only way you can have guaranteed passage to the Ryokyu. Not to mention, as I right now I could open a portal to the real world or soul society and tell them all about your invasion, rendering your surprise attack useless. Bitch. He whispered. The Libro de Cyclos didn't cover too much on actual passage to the Ryokyu, it only told him what he needed to do once he actually breached that dimension. A member of the Royal Guard was necessary, but he figured he could bide his time once he had finished taking out the regular part of soul society. Now, however, their plans could go a lot smoother. He contemplated for a moment, before he clenched his fists in anger. F-U-U-U-C-C-C-K-K-K-K-K-K-K, he screamed to the heavens, his anger shaking through the nearby huts and long hall. As much as he wanted to deny her, he knew he possibly couldn't at this rate. He could try and kill her and find some way to harness the power of her bones, but he was getting restless. He needed to destroy Soul Society, and he needed to do it now. Fine. Have it your way. You'll help us access the Ryokyu when we're finished destroying the main part of Soul Society, but you will not help us with main attack on Seirete. I don't want to see your face while we're fighting. Naruto spat at her. Sakura smirked. Excellent, love. I'm looking forward to working with you again, I've missed you over the years, she winked at Naruto, who sneered at her. This was an infuriating thorn in his side. Sakura had already put her hands together, almost like she was doing hand seals from the living world. However, she glowed with a pink riatsu, and a few seconds later, a portal had opened in mid-air space. It was almost identical in appearance to Garganta, except that the void inside was a bright white instead of a cold black. I will have the preparations for your passage to the Ryokyu ready tomorrow, as soon as I am promoted, she said, as she disappeared into the void, which then rippled closed. Naruto remained standing there, a sour look upon his face. You don't trust her, do you? A new voice said, stepping out of the shadows. Naruto's pissy face turned to view Okuyora stepping out of the awnings of a hut. Of course, I don't. She's a Shinigami, after all, and I can tell she's changed even since she died. I know that's obvious, considering she probably died over 300 years ago, but still, she baffles me. I can't tell if she's leading us into a trap, or if she legitimately wants to help us. Even if that's true, I can't stand taking help from a bitch I want to kill. You're going to kill her once she's not useful anymore, aren't you? Okuyora deadpanned. Naruto looked at Okuyora. Did you even need to ask? This may not even hinder your plan, regardless of whether or not it is a trap. Okuyora stated. How so? Think about it, Naruto. We have eluded the eyes of Soul Society for years. It is safe to say that they do not know about us. If she truly was a double agent for Soul Society and Aizen, she cannot come out with that information in Soul Society. She would likely be executed and the fact that she seemed to be part of that Quincy organization also seems to add credence to that. Despite that, even if she immediately goes back to Soul Society and relays this newfound information to the Seirete, there is not enough suitable time for them to prepare countermeasures for our attack. We are attacking them today, within hours. 
The most she can do is warn them of our attack, which will do no more than impede progress slightly. Is there a chance that she lied about her loyalties, and has truly been loyal to Soul Society? Could the Soul Society have perhaps staged this display, her being part of the Vandenrake and a double agent for Aizen? I don't think so. According to our latest report, the Soul Society has not figured out how to use Garganta yet. That means that her true loyalties would have to be to the Vandenrake or as Aizen's double agent. It's the only way that she'd even be able to be here in the first place. You saw that, Garganta, though, right? What if she's the secret to Soul Society getting to Huecomundo? I did see that, Garganta. However, sales spies have kept good reports within the Soul Society ever since we've connected to their world. They do not know how to use Garganta. She is keeping her power a secret from them. I see. I will trust you on this matter, Olquiora, but we've wasted too much time as is. I'll take your advice, we will attack now in order to prevent them from taking countermatters, on the off chance that she is loyal to Soul Society. Is Sale ready? Yes. Naruto grinned, his previous mood evaporating. Good, let's go. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you enjoyed this what if and want to see next part of it, comment down below and let me know. Also share this video with your friends. See you in the next video. Peace.